So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to VR plus ARC, Workflows in Past, Present and Future. My name is Mikołaj Bazaczek, that's not an easy one. Uh, I'm currently part of a Design Technologies group at Herzog and Demeron, and today I will take you on a short adventure that will show how we went from zero VR usage in the company to uh, practically anybody being able to author VR content relatively easy. All along the, our presentation on the bottom, you will see a time timeline that will allow you to orient yourself when the stuff I'm describing happened. This will look a little bit in the past, but also will uh, look a little bit in the future as well. But first, for those of you that, that don't know, Herzog and Demeron is a company founded by Jacques Herzog and Pierre Demeron in 1978. And you may know some of our buildings, such as Beijing National Stadium, uh, Philharmonie in Hamburg, uh, Tate Modern, both the original conversion and the extension, uh, this beautiful stadium in Bordeaux, or the iconic uh, Vitra House in Germany. And to understand better where this design technology team sits in the company, so the most important thing for us are the projects, of course, but you have all these back office teams supporting the projects. So you have your finance, you have your HR, and you have us, the Design Technologies Group, currently sitting at around 20 people, and we are all architects with a certain Swiss, uh, twist or a certain uh, interest. Uh, basically, what we're doing is helping people to use their uh, digital tools properly. And what's important, we are always working uh, with, like, with a project. We are not a R&D team that closes themselves for a couple of months and then comes out with a solution. And we are not bound usually to one project. So we swap between them uh, quite often. And in the team, we have people that are specialized in modeling, uh, in scripting, programming. Also, we have, of course, Beam and CAD managers, people that are very keen on digital fabrication and manufacturing. Uh, later on the main stage, you will be able to see a talk from, from uh, Florian Frank here about uh, user customizable software. And of course, uh, we have a small VIS team of uh, five people. Two of them are focused on pushing and using virtual reality technology in the company. Uh, one of these people is me. And uh, so today, I, will, I want to take you through a couple of these chapters. Um, and all along the way, you will see what problems, problems that uh, we encountered along the way and how we approach solving them. And of course, we'll take a little uh, look at the near future, a uh, couple of things to look at, and that couple of things that are interesting for us uh, especially. So at the beginning, there was no VR being used in the design process at all. So that's how our normal Vs or VR related workflow look like. So on the top half there, you have normal architects working within the project teams. They have no expert technical knowledge about doing visualization or doing VR. And we work mainly with Rhino and Revit. So what they were able to do is to create some basic renderings with the V-Ray and then print them and present them on the screen. If they had something more technically challenging or, for example, a high-profile press release visualization to do, they would turn to us, the, the design technologies teams, and we would basically export stuff from Rhino, import it into Max, and then render it with V-Ray or create some real-time experiences with Unreal Engine 4. And you can see all, all along the way, we have this manual labor, this monkey work, as I call it, because these are all super tedious tasks that we have to do manually. And spoiler alert, we will try to automate that, but this all will be soon replaced by proper third-party uh, plugins and uh, programs. So uh, this is an example of our real-time experiences at this time. So for example, this interior uh, furniture layouts that we use to convince the client that our proposition is fitting the project better, or this uh, urban simulation when the, this is a high rise in Basel, Switzerland, where the client and we wanted to see how this will impact uh, the city uh, skyline, uh, basically. And instead of doing a dozen of, dozens of renders, we proposed to them doing this interactive simulation that they can go to a virtually any point in the city and then see how it will look like from there. But then uh, this major uh, mainstream, first, let's say, mainstream uh, current uh, VR headset appeared, the Oculus Developer Kit 2, 
And the first real VR usage in our company was actually the staircase. And the team basically approached us because they wanted to conduct a design review tomorrow, yeah, let's say. And they wanted us to 3D print a huge uh, model for them to be able to conduct this design review. And basically we said, okay, in this time frame, this is impossible, but we have this new cool thing called virtual reality and we could try to make it work so you can conduct your design review this way. So they sent us a super, let's say, rough 3D model and head of our team, Stefan Rigas, spent the whole uh, night trying to fix it and make it uh, usable. And uh, we were able to put together a quick scene in Unreal Engine 4 and basically the whole setup was um, not perfect in any way. Yeah? The machine running the VR goggles was underpowered, the environment wasn't very comfortable, but after 30 seconds, 30 seconds of confusion, the partner conducting the design review started pointing fingers at and, and commenting on the design. And basically that design review was a success. And the team came back to us with the feedback that with this tool, they were actually able to pinpoint some design issues that they weren't able to see normally by using drawings and renderings. And they were super excited to first uh, to see this space that they were designing one-to-one, uh, -one, like with their own eyes, with natural perception. So you see on our workflow diagram, we gain the ability to actually author or create these six degrees of freedom through virtual reality uh, experiences now. And of course, this one-to-one -one experience, people are super happy to see it and to be able to visit those spaces, but with all of these come, come problems, yeah? So discomfort, the isolation issue, because you are alone in this space and everybody else can just see the screen that you're, uh, that, that, uh, that you're looking at. Uh, portability was an issue and the workflow to get there was also super complex. So the, the first problem that we wanted to tackle was this portability. So instead of this huge workstation, we built a purpose, uh, a small custom built PC with a powerful GPU. And this thing, this white thing, you are able to move around easily and put it in a meeting room and it looks kind of okay there. And next project that was uh, kind of, an, uh, of a milestone for us was the, this Stadt Casino project where the team approached us because they wanted to do a VR experience because they wanted to convince the heritage guy because they were doing restoration of these classic interiors that whatever they're doing was nice and fine and okay. And for us that was a good project because it's way more complex geometry wise and we wanted to see if it's possible to put this amount of detail in this uh, this new medium and it proved to be working fine up to the extent that the team was so happy that they extended the simulation to the whole interiors and that was also the first time that we used this for a client presentation so they were brave enough to show this to external clients and to let them take a walk basically in this non-existing uh, interior environment. So you can see on the left side that's a normal, let's say, design uh, client meeting environment with prints on the uh, prints and plans on the walls, but in the middle of the room you also have the, the VR setup. And it looks something like this. And remember back in the day there was no one-click plugin or ready-made interfaces. We had to create everything from scratch ourselves. Uh, but we are not a software development company, so it was quite crude, but allowed for basic movement and quick teleportation between uh, important points uh, in the project. So all along the way, we tried to automate these tedious steps. So we automated the UVW unwrapping at this point, um, but that's it. And at this point in time, V-Ray also introduced the 3.4 update, which blew our minds because they introduced rendering in a stereo cube map format which basically meant we could open any of our 3D Smack scenes and just with a flip of a switch, instead of looking at a framed picture, we could find ourselves inside the design for the first time. And for us, that was very important because with minimal work, we had this familiar workflow that we could uh, immediately turn into a VR experience. And this also allowed us to render some super fast renderings such as those. Basically, the team came to, uh, to us with super simple Rhino model, and we rendered it in all this white material and sent it back to them. And with this, they were able to make a design decision if they wanted a three or four flight staircase. They don't need super detailed model for that. 
So we gain these, these benefits of this super familiar fast workflow. But of course, at this point, we don't have really easy way to post-process these images. Suddenly, we have to cover the whole 360 scene. And everything needs to in, be in 3D. We cannot easily Photoshop in people or plants or anything else. And how can we view this stuff without the VR headset? Because we want to communicate with the team or we want to communicate with anybody else. And we can't do this easily. So you can see at this point, we gain the ability to alter this stereo 360 three degrees of freedom VR content that you can look around but not move around. But still, everything has to go through us to through design uh, technology team, the specialists. Yeah, the normal people, let's say, cannot alter anything uh, easily themselves, really. So we next we set on to solving this communication issue. So we create an internal web-based, uh, browser-based tool that allows for simple drag and drop of uh, the rendered panoramas or cube maps and viewing them in a browser. So it's working on the intranet. I can send a link to another person and they can just flip through and comment because they don't need to go into VR to comment on these uh, 360 renders. Uh, necessarily. And what's also important for us, it doesn't reset the viewpoint once you flip through the options because usually we create a lot of variations for, uh, for one viewpoint. So we want, uh, be, we want to be able to compare them easily. And that would mark the end of the first cycle. And the second cycle for us started once the hand track controllers were released. And this is now a given, but back then it was a huge change. And basically, before we had this, uh, this custom interface running with the Xbox 360 gamepad, and that wasn't very, let's say, uh, obvious for a lot of people that aren't used to game controllers. So once we got these hand track controllers, uh, all these issues disappeared because people could just simply point and click and teleport uh, to a point um, to the place they wanted to be in. And this also solved a lot of comfort issues uh, for us. And one uh, feature that was immediately requested upon using these tools in design reviews was simple measuring tools, because partners or uh, important decision-making people would ask questions about certain dimensions, and the team would need then to shuffle all the plans to find this exact dimension. But we could solve this because we have all the data inside the model. So simple, very simple measuring tools solved a lot of issues for us there. So we get this, this feeling of presence, this intuitive movement at this point, but we're losing uh, control over the viewer, which uh, we as architects doing this are very used to because we want to frame our projects in the best possible way. So then along the way, we try to solve this. Usually with the clients, we, would, uh, we, would, we won't give them full unlimited movement within the space of VR uh, simulation. We would actually uh, manually uh, teleport them between different spaces, directing the experience for, for them. So at this point, we also automated more of the steps along the way. And uh, basically, we discovered this is a four times sped up fly through. If you remember the staircase that I uh, mentioned on the, at the beginning, the team liked this medium so much, they decided to expand this to the whole interiors of the art gallery that they were designing. And we discovered that hey, a well-prepared, real-time, uh, ready scene is actually like the topmost asset, the topmost medium that we can easily extract still images or videos out uh, from. So this is rendered within Unreal in minutes let's say, and that was very powerful. And now with the V-Ray integration, I could go, I guess, and just render this out with the proper ray traced uh, quality uh, using V-Ray for Unreal, which, is, which I find very powerful. And then uh, the third cycle started, which I think it's uh, lasting up until now. So basically, NVIDIA did some voodoo magic and was able to shrink down these powerful GPUs into these portable form factors and still doing it with the 2080s. Uh, so this enabled us to have truly portable VR setups, which is very important because ease of use, the, the friction that you have, it's uh, very important if you want to show it to the client. If there's any friction of or the things look difficult or cumbersome, the more people will refuse to take a look at it. And at this point, we also upgraded our whole office to V-Ray 3.4, which enabled normal people to render uh, stereoscopic panoramas themselves, which is very, very nice. 
And as you can see uh, in this screenshot, we also started to tackle the 3D assets problem. So basically, we started scanning uh, our own employees. And uh, I always ask them if they want to be immortalized, because we can, we can do that easily. And you can see they are not super detailed model, but for like medium to far distances, uh, they are pretty good. And we don't have any fancy DSLR setup to do this. We are using just a structure sensor attached to an iPad. We ask them to stand still for a couple of minutes. And this way, we're able to get these OK quality scans that are usable in uh, all VR and VIS mediums. So you can see now with uh, V-Ray, normal uh, architects within the teams are able to alter this three degrees of freedom VR content, and then they can use some mobile uh, VR glasses basically to show this to the client, which is, again, different, let's say, because you lose the possibility of movement, but you can take <coughs> this uh, in, inside your backpack to a New York to in a private situation with a client and just very easily put this on the client's head and show him how the project will look like. And that's also important, this friction with this mobile headset, while less powerful and less real, it's super easy to put somebody in this virtual experience. So the portability goes up, the ease of use uh, again increases, but with this the demand increased as well because everybody noticed this new VR medium and clients also started asking for it without necessarily knowing what does it uh, do or how it's useful for them. And of course, scheduling expectations because everybody was used to doing images, but nobody knew how much work actually goes into preparing these VR simulations or VR uh, stereoscopic panoramas. So we have to, to, to combat that, let's say. And I want to show to you these two, uh, last two, um, let's say last, or the pinnacle projects for these two types of medium the pre-rendered stereoscopic panoramas that, uh, again, this Roche company that is bu building this high rise in Basel asked us to do because they want to show to the public and to their uh, future employees how this, uh, their campus will look like. So the, the, our initial idea was to take a 360 picture and just render the towers in, but we couldn't do it because the, the street that you see on these renders is already a building site. So we have to recreate everything in 3D. So it was quite an immense, uh, huge scene uh, to render out, but we managed to collect all the data from the teams and model uh, the, the surrounding street in 3D in order to create these high quality stereoscopic panoramas. And then they did a nice thing because they put these glasses on a sidewalk, so anybody who passes by is able to see from this exact uh, camera viewpoint how this will look like in the future. And another example for the real time, let's say, tour. Uh, uh, also, the request came from our clients. So this is the horizontal skyscraper in Moscow. It's very close to the close to the business district in Moscow. And during the project reveal. Uh, let's say VR was used as a powerful communication tool. Half gimmick, half super powerful communication tool. And actually this was kind of a um, not normal situation for us because client approached us and asked us to prepare this content, but usually we would externalize this type of uh, presentation. But in this time frame and with the design changes really going up to the last days, we had to do it internally. So over a couple of weeks, we were able to prepare this self-contained VR tour that runs without any operator, let's say. And it was a very powerful comp complementary thing uh, in addition to our physical model, plans, uh, images, and then of course videos. And how this thing was structured, actually it was a hybrid because we had a lot of pre-rendered images that allowed us to put a lot of detail into these renders with foliage and stuff like that. And we spice things up with some real-time sequences such as going up and down with a lift to the building itself and having a short uh, urban scale intro that would explain the project uh, itself. So this is how our workflow actually looks uh, right now. Let's say, so we have on the top again, normal project, uh, working in project architects, being able uh, with V-Ray and Enscape to author any type of VR content. And that's very important because they don't have the technical knowledge and they don't really have time to acquire all this technical knowledge to create VR experiences. So this one-click workflow is very powerful for us, but sometimes you need 
more graphical fidelity or you need a custom user experience when you want to limit or direct uh, the experience with the user. So that's when we, we still go through the, through the digital uh, technologies team and then you can see all our, let's say, uh, inferior automation work is now replaced by uh, proper third-party software like uh, Unreal Studio or V-Ray for Unreal and probably more coming in the future. Um, so this is where we are now. Uh, basically, this means that we in digital technologies team, we, don't, we no more have to do this draft or uh, tedious work, let's say. But challenges remain because we have these very specific requirements sometimes. And now we have to teach other people how to handle this uh, hardware and how to handle this new medium properly, which presents its own set of challenges, of course. And a quick look in the future, uh, stuff that's interesting for me. Because if you would ask me, I don't know, two or three years ago, I would guess that all the major 3D content uh, creator crea 3D content uh, creator programs would have a VR mode or something like this. And you know that this, this didn't really happen. So it's very interesting for me to see this push into real-time VR, uh, let's say, capabilities coming from experienced players like Chaos Group and Epic Games and to see where this will go and how this will influence the AEC uh, industry. But also, as you saw before, uh, for in our environment, Enscape is also gaining a lot of traction because if it is it's ease of use. And it's, re it's interesting to see because this is a new player on the market that came out of nowhere and in my eyes is gaining a lot of, uh, let's say, ground really fast. On the hardware side, you can also see a, a certain split because you have the Oculus, the Facebook Oculus going towards the mobile path, which is interesting because, again, it's super easy to use for, for let's say, non-super technical people. But uh, it's, of course, underpowered compared to a uh, PC Tether headset. So we don't have any uh, examples of working with this yet because it's super fresh, but I think it will be, again, powerful. If you can imagine going uh, on a private meeting with a client, pulling this out of your bag and having this magical moment in a matter of minutes without needing any technical stuff uh, to set up some tracking hardware and so on. But on the other hand, you have headsets like Valve Index, or uh, the Vario uh, presented here on the show floor that are really um, mm, very well specced and they provide superior experience. Yeah, But I think we'll find place for both, but this will again require some technical knowledge uh, to properly use. But I think in our pipeline, uh, for example, for internal design reviews, this should uh, work pretty easily. But if you want to quickly and effortlessly introduce a client into VR world, maybe the mobile headset uh, is a better way to do that. And one thing that's very interesting for me personally is light fields. Uh, so basically, instead of uh, rendering a fixed point perspective, we, are, uh, we, we probably will be able to capture or render a volume that you can move in, inside and perceive it in a photorealistic quality. So if you have access to a PC, uh, VR headset, and you didn't try yet the, the Welcome to Lightfields demo, which is free on the Steam platform, uh, I highly recommend it. Because in my opinion, the workflow is already there. We can use our existing 3D content creation program to render out the light field, and that would bring a totally new, let's say, quality to, this, to these experiences. And I'm very excited to see where this will uh, go in the future because, the, let's say, the, the, the pipeline, the tools are not there yet, but I hope they will be uh, in the future. And to sum, sum up, let's say, I think VR as a uh, tool or as a medium in architecture industry is there to stay because uh, we see every day how it's providing something that wasn't possible before to enter a one-to-one -one representation of the design of our building that we can perceive naturally that wasn't possible before. And this uh, sits nicely within our workflow. It's not maybe rev uh, doing a revolution with our workflows, but it's uh, enabling us to make informed decisions way faster and way better. And actually, it's making it quite fun to inspect uh, the design at the end. I don't, know, I don't know if the VR will become a next computing platform, but for the architects, I think it's here to stay. Thanks for your attention.
Thank you, Mikolaj. We've got time for a couple of questions before we move on to our next speaker, but I just wanted to comment. I think it's really fascinating to see your workflow, your current pipeline, take advantage of three of our speakers already. So we had Enscape, uh, Unreal Engine, and V-Ray all speak within uh, today's session. It's great to see that workflow converging around some of these tools and so many of our, our hardware HMD partners upstairs as well. So over to the audience, any questions for Mikolaj? It's quiet. Okay, go, uh, going up, oh, we've got one here, okay. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, really interesting to see how you guys make use of all these different tools. Um, you did mention that for some of the design reviews, design teams might come to you with a challenge or a task that they want to test out a day before uh, the presentation or like a couple hours before the review. How, how do you, let's say, combat that or how do you structure your work in terms of, let's say, ideally for Unreal Model you want like a week or two weeks or do you just sort of respond to the different challenges as they're being presented to you at your desk? How, most of your sort of timelines for executing these these tasks because you showed on the workflow there is, as you called it yourself, like monkey tasks that could be optimized. Uh, have you found that you guys are getting faster at producing all of that or you're increasing the quality? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, just general yeah, question. I think I understand the question how to get around basically crazy requirements or crazy deadlines that are a norm in architectural workflows. Uh, there is no easy solution. <laughs> so basically this monkey work, manual work, was replaced either by uh, a proper third-party software or by our own automation. So this reduced this time a lot. But basically what we can do, we have these crazy demands and then we, can, we have to usually say to manage the expectations basically, okay, within this time frame this is possible. And then we try our best uh, to fit the best possible content within this time frame, yeah, let's say. But as you said, it's difficult. It's important to educate people because they expect super fast Photoshop fixes, yeah, let's say some stuff that they're used to that was possible to fix in a matter of minutes. Now it's, you need hours to, to modify the, the VR model. Uh, that's it. But uh, I think this is a problem that's not really solved because we usually underestimate the time needed for creating this VR content still and uh, there is a lot of overtime included and um, I don't have an easy answer uh, to that apart from properly estimating and making use of these automated pi pipelines that all the, uh, all the um, uh, software vendors are providing. Okay, one more question. Hi, thanks for that. It was very, very impressive. Uh, I have a quick question. Have you ever uh, tried to experiment with augmented reality yet? Mm, so, no, and um, not yet, because I think the hardware, personally, I think the hardware is not yet. We are waiting for, for the hardware to get better. We have a lot of it to interest in AR as well, but the usual comment we get from architects that, uh, from, let's say, not super uh, guys that are not into VR technology, the usual comment we get that why this VR headset is so blurry, why it's not sharp, why can I see pixels, because they are so used to high resolution screens. So for them, the current state of VR technology is not enough, and AR in terms of field of view and what we can get, what visual fidelity we can get, it's even worse there. I think it will, it's interesting, especially as HDM, we are working a lot with physical models. So uh, enhancing or expanding these physical models with AR, it's going to be something very interesting for us. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.